Hi everyone, this is Brian Hayes and welcome to part three, the final part of our fascinating conversation with the great Mike Hayes. We're going to kick start this section with a video clip of Mike and I playing an improvised blues recorded here in June 2021 at the B&M Studios. There's a couple of important points to note in this video clip. Firstly, we never intended to record this. Mike and I had went out for a pizza and just had a general discussion of where we would take the podcast, the type of subject matters that we would be talking about. We come back here to the studio. Mike did not have any of his own guitars, but we decided to just sit together and, and see if we could fit on the screen with just one camera playing two guitars. We plugged into our mixing desk and as a test recording of levels, just set the software into play and decided to play an improvised blues. The only discussion we had was that we would play a blues in G. That's it. That's the only talk and away we went. There's two important points to have a look at here. You might remember at the end of part two of this conversation, Mike was speaking about the importance of silence and allowing space in music, space for the music to breathe. At the end of the second chorus on rhythm guitar, I decided to come to a dead stop. It wasn't planned, it was just something in my mind at the time. Have a close look how Mike reacted to that sudden unplanned silence. No panic, definitely the type of guy you want in the pilot seat at 30,000 feet when all engines in the Boeing 737 have cut out. The other thing is have a look at the very final thing Mike does on the guitar at the end of the blues. He does a one finger, right hand, one finger harmonic, chord harmonic. Extremely difficult to do on the guitar, but have a look how casually he ends the recording with that magic moment on the guitar. Here we are, the great Mike Hayes on lead guitar and myself on rhythm and the music Mind Blues. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. We had a whole lot of fun playing that and it sort of reminds me of a great album that Chet Atkins and Les Paul did called Chester and yeah. Lester. Do you remember that album, yeah. Mike? unbelievable. Two of the greatest guitar players in the world. They just left the mics open, left the tape going. Um, you know, some of the timing was a bit out, a few wrong notes here and there, loose as a goose. You would have heard all of that in what we just played, yeah. but I love it. The it's end real. result is it's, it's real true. and it's Absolutely. a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the message Mike is saying from the music mind is keep it real. Just yeah. yeah. Don't be scared of the odd mistake here and there because, yeah. you know, particularly in music, um, I just want to touch on this for a minute that if you're an advanced musician and you're hearing what you're playing, we've got to remember that no one else can hear what we're hearing in our head. And many a time I've played a solo and thought, Oh God, there's a you know, what am I gonna do about that clanger? Then I woke up the next day and listen, where's the clanger? Yeah. I was actually searching for where's the clanger. Have you got any thoughts on that where some people get so scared to play anything that they'll make that they may make a mistake well, that they it can yeah. totally paralyze you. I mean, really speaking, there's two things people remember. Good sound, good feel. Yeah. They don't know whether you miss the diminished chord in the third no. verse in the second song in the set. I think that's a really powerful quote there, guys, from the podcast, the great Mike Hayes two things is good sound and a good feel. 
Um, I, I want to go back to Herb Albert because Herb's a favourite of mine and Definitely. co-owner of A&M Records yeah. and uh, you and me model so much of ourselves on Herb Albert and yes. Jerry Moss and yeah. the reason this is called the B&M Studios is it's Brian and Mike, yeah. Albert and Moss. Yeah. But Herb in that recent podcast, I recommend everyone listen to the Tom Scott podcast series where he talks to Herb Albert and he talks about it was always the feel. Herb yeah. would close his eyes, he'd turn his back on the performer because he didn't want to, he couldn't care less whether the performer could do Elvis Presley's moves or whatever. He wanted to hear and feel what he heard right. was like for him. Yes, I we, thought that was an amazing yes. moment when you think Herb Albert and A&M Records recorded um, Cat Stevens well, at the, I, I don't know where to start. No. Uh, you know, it's like if you yeah. have a look at the history of A&M yeah. Records and the people they've recorded and, you know, the the albums, the Tapestry album and all of this sort of stuff, it's just ridiculous. Sting, um, yeah. and in the jazz field, I think it was Wes Montgomery yeah. and, and Stan Getz, and I oh. think he even did a record with um, Louis Armstrong at one stage, but Herb was all about the feel. Yeah. Mate, I want to talk now about your arranging skills because there was a, a, a period where you were, re you were doing paid arrangements. I remember people were paying you to do charts up for corporate type band type gigs and, yeah. and what have you. Um, now you formally studied arranging. Can you tell us a little bit about your study with uh, I think the Berkeley College of Music? Yes, yeah. with Berkeley uh, with a great instructor Les Harris and Les was very encouraging. Um, uh, he would always encourage me to keep developing my own style. You'd have the Berkeley course and then I'd go off in some little tangent uh, because I felt that's what I heard, so I'd want to write that. And it was nothing to do with the course. Uh, and then so I'd go off and put some little introduction or fill in or some little segue into in, in the chart. And then he'd write back and say, that's a good idea, you know, and things like that. I, I'm, it was so different from the original thing of like having the coins on my hands with the yeah. the piano and uh, no parallel fifths. And it was a total different thing altogether. Very encouraging, um, you know, and just to help me develop my own um, strength and my own capabilities. And I think that would be sort of the thing all the way along the line. Doesn't matter whether it was Bunny Hodgins or uh, Bruce Clark or Don Andrews or whoever. Uh, they gave me confidence to keep going and uh, working out my own way of doing things. And, and folks, I, I've got to keep bringing the subject back to self-directed learning. No one sent Mike to a arranging course. It was something avoid in you thought yep, in your absolutely. skill set. Absolutely. And Mike searched that out and studied what he wanted to study. Yep who he wanted to study from and when. I just think nowadays, I think, you know, there's so much room to improve the education process where everyone's forced to go to school and wear the same uniform and read the same textbooks and they all come out like little robots uh, and they don't sound like Mike Hayes as far as if they're musicians. So, Mike, before we get back to the conversation, I, I want to pause for a moment and talk about the importance of aligning with quality repair people no matter what yeah. instrument you're playing yeah. at the start of the podcast you made a really important point that when we got our first guitars we didn't know anything about having a guitar set up no I, I thought you just bought a guitar and you played it and a lot of people I see coming to me for lessons and that they're playing instruments that are just about unplayable I agree I see it on all the different instruments that I teach you're holding my Gibson ES345 that was made in 1969 I think I got it in about 1973. So oh. it's got a bit of age on it. And recently I took it to my guitar uh, tech person, Gabriel Ocateco of Ocateco Guitars in Brisbane. Gabriel's a fantastic guitar maker and repairer. And as you can see, this guitar has had all of the hardware replaced with the gold plating had completely gone over the 50 years or whatever that I've had that. Mm. And also all of the wiring and the guitar and a full setup, and you actually got to play that before. What do you think of the yeah. setup on that guitar? Yeah, it's different from how I normally have my guitar set up, but it's set up very, very well. And uh, the guitar really, uh, the setup that uh, Gabriel's done there has really brought this guitar back to life, given it a whole new lease of life. I can see that. Yeah. So, folks, if you are playing guitar and you've never had your guitar set up, seek out a 
relationship with a repairer, someone that you can become uh, acquainted to and, and stick with. Mike's already talked about how Chris Melville, for him, has been his go-to guy, and Gabriel has been mine on all of my stringed instruments. I'm holding the famous Boots Randolph tenor sax Selma Mark Seven here. Now, Mike, when we were both playing saxophones, do you remember a guy called Alan Thurlow in Brisbane? Alan Thurlow, I certainly do. Fantastic guy. Yeah, yeah. we we were up at Gympie, and, and when we started investing in saxophones, we'd ask around in Brisbane, ask the best players in Brisbane who they take their instruments to to get repaired, and uh, Alan's name just kept coming up. So we trekked out to Manly, which is a fair drive from Gympie, and I still remember when we met Alan for the first time. Fantastic guy. His workshop was uh, basically a, a fishing type shed in his backyard, but there was some magic in that shed. I was always worried if a, a, pa a pelican or another pigeon landed on the roof that we might all end up in the shed collapse. But uh, Alan, nothing was too hard for Alan. Um, you know, he'd have the cricket on and there'd be a, a joke and a laugh, but you'd walk away with yeah. saxophones that yeah. played vastly better yeah. than when Absolutely. we turned up. Yeah. I can yeah, always yeah. remember one of Alan's party tricks was you'd have a brand new, very expensive saxophone like this, and, and Alan would wrestle with the, the bell and twist it around as if he was twisting the neck off a snake, and you'd think, oh my God, you know, you just had to look the other way, but when you actually played that saxophone, <laughs> I don't know what was the magic in, in Alan doing that, but it always played so much better. Alan retired quite some time ago, and his daughter Joy and her husband Scott have been running Thurlow's Musical Instrument Repairs in Brisbane since Alan retired. And these are fantastic people. They are doing amazing work, repair work, at a really affordable price. So uh, a shout out to Alan, Joy and Scott and also Gabriel, and as Michael has already recognised in the podcast, Chris Melville. Yes. Thanks very much, guys, and we'll now go back to the conversation. I want to play a sax track here. Um, I've resisted it. This is Mike's podcast, but the saxophone and the guitar has been a, a, a massive part, I think, of your yeah. early playing. But before we do, I want to, and Mike's kindly agreed to back me up on this, I want to let you hear what saxophone playing sounded like in the late 60s and the early 70s here in Gympie. And I'll just play a little classic dance band <laughs> track. This is a beauty called Love is a Beautiful Song. We'll just play a little bit of it for you and I'm sure you'll love this. The greatest respect of the sax players in the time, that's pretty much what we were hearing here in Gympie from the dance band era. But somehow or other, I was listening to Phil Woods from New York and Dave Sanborn, and Mike's already said he was listening to Lee Rittenour and Larry Carlton. I want you to have a bit of a listen and enjoy the sax outtake solo chorus on Why Not that features some pretty red hot alto playing and some great support guitar playing. Have a listen to this. This is how we were hearing saxophone and guitar, not what we were hearing locally. <laughs>
I hope you've enjoyed that. That was, again, another composition by us two guys. Mike doing some fantastic support playing. If you noticed, he left all of the space in the world for the alto sax solo, and there was more than a couple of double high Cs in there for you saxophone fans. Mate, I want to, we're coming down the home straight here. I want to talk about your teaching career. You've taught literally thousands of students online and in person. Do you remember your first ever guitar lesson that you provided as the teacher? Yep, it was a guy who lived along the street, a guy called Mike Smith. Wow. And, uh, and, and the second lesson I ever taught was a guy called Paul Frampton and okay. and then Mark Stokes. So people lived around there and they'd actually come up to the house and uh, I hadn't really started teaching or anything like that, but they were interested in what was going on. What do you remember about that very first lesson, the first time you were in the teacher's seat rather than the player's seat? Well, it was like, what am I going to teach this guy? Yeah, It's like... He's a guy, he wants to know something, and I'm thinking, how am I going to explain it uh, to him? So what I always wanted was the guy to actually get it. So I wanted him to get whatever they come for, what they wanted. And it's the old story, you can teach a student what they want to know, but you can't teach them what to want to know. You know wow. Over the years. Folks, there's another quote. Big difference. You can't teach them what they want yeah. to know. They need to come to you looking for information with a belief that you can help them achieve their objective. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. well, you, it's like they've got to ask the question. I mean, like they mm. come on, uh, if they want to know a D chord or whatever they want to know, that's great. But it's the depth of the question uh, that's going to determine how far the lessons go and how far much information you can give them. I think that's really important because my experience as a teacher is often it's sort of like someone will walk in and more or less entertain me. Please entertain me. I'm paying you some money. I'll watch you play for a while. And and to me, it comes back to what do you think makes for a good student? What what When you think of all of those thousands of lessons you've taught, shifting to the other side of the screen or the table, what do you think makes for a good student when they come to learn off you? What you're really looking for is passion, mm -hmm. really. And if the person has passion, they'll be internally motivated. Yep. Which means they've got the drive and the persistence to keep going. Because things do get tough, and the whole thing about music is eventually the the further you get into it uh, it reveals who you are so you've got to deal with yourself your personality I remember again I'm bringing up Bob Venia quite a lot but Bob Bob said, if you're I, out there mate uh, we're I, looking for you yeah and uh, yep. I remember Bob saying to us when we were down there he said you'll learn a lot more about yourself than you ever will yes. about the guitar and, absolutely uh, yeah. and I think it comes back to we heard Bruce Clark say that one of the quotes he's always lived by we actually heard it earlier in the podcast that he would never go flying with a person who hasn't flown. Oh, I think that's something. I think up. that's great. Mm -hmm. In fact, and I am a quote lover, a, a quote I read just the other day says that the, this person said, and I'll ask you who you think it might be, and I quote, if you get good at something, really good at something, you must pass it on. Who do you think said that quote? Well, I don't know. I love it, though. Doc Severinsen, wow. aged 91 years of age. I, I, it's very powerful. Because I think of you there, mate. You've spent your life acquiring knowledge, but you've also spent your entire life passing it on. Yeah. So uh, for those of you out there who, who don't know Doc Severinsen, I think just do yeah. a bit of research. He's still playing the trumpet mm. very well at age 93. Um, and one of the most, we are sitting in a house and Mike mentioned it a little bit earlier that he heard some great arrangements blasting out. Um, and surprisingly, uh, Mike, you know, when you're talking about George Gold and the trombone sounds, uh, I mean, I only learnt relatively recently that my favourite record of all time recorded in 1961 on 35 millimetre tape, Doc Severinsen Tempestuous Trumpet. Doc's the only trumpet player on that record. Every other brass instrument is a bank of trombones. Oh, my so what we were hearing screaming out of the stereo 
across the road, literally 50 or 60 metres across the road, we'd come home and, and I don't know, had we been playing much music at that stage? No, or, no, no. no, no. And, and over the road, Doc Severinsen recorded in 1961. I was born in 1961. I think he was 33 when he recorded that album. I, I remember later on thinking, that he, he, this guy must be Arben or someone who's 100 years old and you could not play the trumpet that well and still be alive. Well, um, you know, if you get good at something, really good at it, you must pass it on, not yeah. optional. And uh, it's a credit to you that you have got really good at playing the guitar, but you, you to this day, you pass that knowledge on. I think that's a, an absolute uh, credit to you. Mate, let's talk about online teaching right. versus, versus in person. Like we're, we're recording this on the 30th of June in 2021 right here in Australia. And Australia has been lucky with COVID, but right now a big part of southeast Queensland, not where we are here today, but just to the south of us is in lockdown, mm. a three-day lockdown. Um, tell us about your venture into online teaching because you were one of the early adopters of this just tell us whatever you want to mate about one uh, Skype tuition one on one and we've got some great images of you here doing some Skype talking let's talk about that first tell us about your experience with one to one Skype tuition well I'm doing more and more of it and I do think it's going to be the way of the future really um, with the way the world's going and um, it has certain issues uh, with the technology and that in that you can't play at the same time like mm. if a person comes to the studio uh, in town here we can sit down we can jam or whatever yes. they want to do and you can get instant feedback um, you can't really do that in the, in the Skype situation however some of my really uh, promising students and inquisitive students, inquiring minds, are actually from people all over the world now with the Skype. So it's a, it's quite interesting. Uh, well, having a bigger pool of people. Yes. Um, hopefully, it's all about getting the connections. That you've got to be the right teacher for the student, and again, the right student for the teacher. It's getting that mix. What about your online publishing? I think one of the really exciting things that you did must be. 15 years ago or how long ago 2004 2004, 2004 guys yeah, yeah. Mike started publishing guitar methods and courses and short courses and what have you online and tell us about that because a lot of people would be really interested in your path to um, providing your information for a fee as a commercial venture but basically leaving footsteps behind when you're gone with your thoughts on various aspects of playing the guitar. What sort of courses are available and what's the history of those online courses? Well, it was born out of necessity and as a funny situation was I was complaining about uh, to a student uh, back in 2003 about uh, the quality of information because the guy's going onto YouTube and that or whatever was at the available at the time. He said, look, you know, which is the real G chord? I'm learning G at school. <laughs> this is the G chord charming on YouTube for yep. this song. You tell me there's another G chord. And I no, said, there's, there's a lot many of G chords. Them. Yeah. And he said, which one's right? And I said, well, uh, it depends on the song and uh, it's the right way to play it anyway. This kept going on about, you know, another guy brought in a song and he must have about, it looked like 40 pages of versions of this one song. Oh. He said, which one's the right wow. one? Yeah. And I said, well, look, at, I had a look at one or two. I said, at this stage, it's correct. And at this bar here, it's not. And so I said, mm. but really, honestly, uh, you've got to use your ears. And this is a thing of like the right theory and all this sort of stuff for the job at hand. Yes. So that's the type of hat you wear. So out of necessity, and uh, I, he said, well, look, what, what are you whinging about this? Why don't you do something about it? Mm. And, and I said, well, it's a lot of effort. I don't know how to go about it doing uh, this. And so I started doing little things where people could do like after their lesson, I could send them through little worksheets and yep. stuff like that. And it yep. started from a very, very primitive fashion. But eventually they developed into little handouts and then later on to booklets and all that type of thing. And um, mm. the course just developed from there. It was just a local thing initially. Yep. And then uh, uh, started websites and, and, and being able to contact, make contact with people again. Yes. Uh, 
like an earlier version of what's happening on Skype now. And, yes. Um, yeah, people were able to make contact, and we've taught thousands of people yeah. uh, over the Which years. Which is really amazing. Um, I think our viewers would be very interested in, you've had a great career in music as a full-time professional, but you've lived your entire life in the small city in which you were born, mm. yet you've reached out to the world. You've just heard Mike say yeah. he's taught thousands yeah. of people around the world yeah with his online courses and if people are interested in those courses the best place to find out is your website Just my website could i can point them in the direction they want to go because it's a matter of again getting something that's a good fit yeah we have courses at different levels and yep. uh, we're currently working on developing that further as a global situation because getting back to your earlier point mm. with skype and everything like that yep. that's the way it's got to move we're expanding oh, to a global community i think so before we get back to the conversation, Mike, we've got two completely contrasting tracks we want to listen to here. The first one is a five-part guitar track. Tell us a bit about this one. Yeah, they're uh, all played on the George Benson Ibanez, and I just overdubbed the five guitar parts uh, over a rhythm section. So this is in a, a jazz style? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And immediately following that, we're going to go to a contemporary guitar solo from a song we wrote way back in the 1980s called watch out i believe this is played on the bill lawrence yep. guitar this one just a clean sound and uh, a little bit of reverb that was it yeah As I say, we're lucky in Australia comparatively with the impacts of COVID, but what do you think the whole COVID-19 experience has taught the music industry? Well, you've got to be able to adapt, and you've got to be able to adapt quickly. The whole situation is a different game now altogether. Absolutely. Just as Bunny came up in the uh, vaudeville, yep. and then the banjo was in vogue and all that sort of thing. and. Uh, Later on, technology came in with MIDI for us and so on, and that changed the way we worked. And uh, a musician who really can't adapt quickly is going to find it hard in the future because it's changing now so fast. Mm. Uh, really, I'd say, like, uh, even on a daily basis, I'm oh. just before I come here, uh, some people contact me on Instagram now. Honestly, three weeks ago, I didn't even have an Instagram account. Or oh, sorry, I did have an Instagram account, but as far as me working, I had to upload yeah. a video to it, I wouldn't have worked out. But I actually had to do it in this last couple of weeks. So uh, that's an interesting point. So social media, you are on Instagram. Uh, any other social media? Yep, all the ones. Facebook, all Facebook, and Facebook, that's your honour, though. Twitter. How do you find those? Uh, I mean, is it a nightmare just keeping on top of your social media channels or... How have you found it? it? It's managing it uh, is the problem, and I've got to really look at what where the um, the effectiveness comes from. Like yeah. we get a lot of people from Facebook, uh, yep. uh, as, as far as inquiries that turn into lessons locally. Yes, we get lots of sales from uh, Twitter for our international courses. Okay, and 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 it's it's I find they're all different, but yep. it's actually a management yep. thing uh, to work out how we're going to. Uh, Go forward. On Go that. forward. Yeah, yeah. Is that something you've brought in outside help to set those up and help you market, or are you, uh, or are you doing that largely uh, in house? We have our own webmaster that works on our websites and sets anything up if I need something to yeah. be changed. Remarkable. Yep. Uh, how they can uh, get that sorted out for me, and uh, he's a full time webmaster. Okay. Um, and uh, from Malaysia, actually, so the different country altogether. Yep. 
uh, and yep. uh, so, but That's most the international nature. Yeah, of, absolutely, yep. again, yep. and uh, the uh, most of what we're doing, we're learning here. We're investing in a lot of technology uh, for us to put together our own, basically, television show from our studio. Great. Okay, and like yep. our concerts, virtual concerts, like the Jimmy Barnes sort of thing at yes. home, uh, like through the COVID thing, because. Yep. Even though we've got the studio where people can come in and visit to us, I can see we've got situations, like we're saying with all these lockdowns yep. and stuff, it's not going to go away. No. You know, it's going to be an ongoing presence, so mm. uh, uh, ongoing problem. So um, looking at how we can adapt uh, and how we uh, make contact with our students, how they, they interact with us in the future. I think it's a really good example. Um, one of the emails that came through just while we're recording this uh, is a, a guy from Indiana in the USA who's approached me for tenor sax lessons. Oh. And this is, you know, we're living in a small regional area of Australia. But one of the things I love about the internet is that, you know, I'm just as interested in teaching someone in Iceland as I am from someone who Absolutely. lives three doors yeah. down the road, yeah. as long as they are genuinely interested in learning. Yeah. And if I look at a technology, the cassette technology allowed me to improve my education. Yeah. Bruce Clark, for example. I'd be listening to cassettes from Bruce as I was travelling to Brisbane or wherever I was working yep. at the time. Now the internet gives me a chance to give back. Uh, yeah. Yes. Again, it's technology again. And it's, I just see yeah. the same thing happening. Again. Yeah, it's fantastic, isn't it? We'll just have a listen to Mike now playing solo jazz guitar for a moment. This is totally different style, and, and you're playing just over a jazz standard here on your George Benson Ibanez, I believe. Yeah. Just have a listen to the quality of the sound, the tone Mike gets out of his guitar here. Very special, very much a singing quality. That's fantastic. Mike, what's your thoughts when you're playing a piece like that, just on your own, completely exposed, no uh, roaring click track or drum track or any, any arrangement to hide behind? What are you thinking of when you are playing solo guitar? It's all about the music. And that's it. Yep. And so each note leads you to the next note, like just in a conversation. It's yep. all about the music. And again, what you're hearing in your head what I like about playing solo guitar, you can play in rubato, you can freely move. What I've always liked piano players, and the way they can play with solo piano. Yep. And the, the, the very good solo pianos, they can actually create all this movement and emotion, and that's what it's about, getting an emotional response from the listener. So, look, folks, I think what we're hearing from Mike as far as the music mind goes is it's not a technical approach. It's not... Is it fair to say that you're not, when you're playing something like that, thinking of a scale chord relationship? Not at all. Not at all. Not yeah. at all. And no. look, some students might be disappointed to hear that because there's no easy fix answer. Um, it's I share Mike's thoughts on this, is that I'm not a lover of playing the Dorian minor mode over a minor seventh to a seventh. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm actually just interested. Do I hear anything I want to play at all in my head against that chord sequence? And if the answer's no, I'll happily go and have a honey sandwich or something and yeah. find something else well, to do I in life. I'm aware that you can play uh, a scale over this chord. I'm aware of that. But if, if we go back to the thoughts of it being music, we're having this conversation now. Mm. If you're thinking about this conversation, trying to relate that to oh. the alphabet, it's too slow. It can't work. No. So if I'm trying to play music and I'm thinking about what I'm doing relating to scales and that, it's just not going to come out well at all. It's going to come out very stiff and stodgy. So are, are you saying, do you sort of, I suppose, um, support the concept that 
it's important to learn your scales yep. and your chords yep. because to my way of thinking that opens up your mind's right. ear as to possibilities Absolutely. but when you're playing throw all of that out the window is it that, has is to that become you, so? uh, yes so it has yeah. to become subconscious knowledge if you like rather than in, in something that you own it like in other words if yep. it's a conscious knowledge and it means I've got to think about oh he's played a 251 in G uh, so therefore I can do this and stuff yes. that's not going to come out as music no. it's come out as an exercise so look we're going to wrap it up pretty soon here Mike but can you name and I know there will be at least 30 but three guitar players that really influenced you when you were listening to them as a kid growing up, who do you think, if you had a name, and not in any order, but three guitarists who had a big impact on your wanting to become a better player or, and the style in which you play today? Well, that's a really hard one to narrow that down. But, I mean, I'd have mm. to say just, if we said just one for mm -hmm. a start, it would be Tony Matola. Wow, Tony... Folks, you need to Google Tony Matola. Yeah, Tony Matola's a, a, an amazing guitar player in the history of the guitar. And uh, interestingly enough, one of my happiest memories in this room, when it way before it was a, a music studio, it was really a, a, a practice room. And we had, you'll remember, Mike, we had a pair of Bose 301 yep. stereo yeah. speakers. We had a good Luxman power amp, a great connoisseur turntable. We had an amazing sounding stereo in this room. And our father, who worked very hard in his day job, had a little hobby that he liked. We had all the best quality cassette decks and God knows what else. And Dad would come in here and make up his own little, uh, not karaoke tapes, but road trip tapes. Mm. Tapes that he would listen to to relax. And all of the classics from his era there, Mitch Miller singing whatever it is, and, and Alexander's Ragtime Band. But I remember walking into this room one day when Dad was just sitting over there going through our record collection, looking for stuff that he might like to put on. Mm. And he was actually playing off a Tony Metalla record, Tony's version of Tico Tico. Okay. And when I walked in, the, the trumpet solo in, to, in Tico Tico was Doc Severinsen at full flight. So it was Tony and Doc in full flight. And Dad looked at me and said, that's good trumpet playing. That's clean guitar playing. And I'm just thinking, Wow, I've had this guy wrong all those years. But isn't it interesting yeah. that the playing was just so good yeah, couldn't miss that it. even Dad, who by his own admission was tone deaf, just was attracted to how good yeah. that playing was. And please check out Tony Matola, yeah. one of the best sounds in the world. Yeah. Anyone else, Mike? I know there's a list of a hundred we could go well, on. It's yeah? just about everybody that ever plays guitar because yeah. I'm really amazed. It can be just somebody that actually has only played a guitar for a couple of weeks and they found out a really cool way of doing something that never occurred to me. But in a short, yeah. free thing, uh, uh, free guitar players, there'd be uh, Tony Matola. I'd say Barney Kessel. Yes. Uh, for his just absolute way that he plays chords on the guitar just unbelievable and Herb Ellis uh, for his tone he yeah. just gets a lovely tone uh, there's a fantastic album called Mellow Guitar with uh, or oh, Soft and Mellow sorry it is Herb Ellis Soft and Mellow yeah so yeah. folks you're hearing one of the world's best guitar players here he's just mentioned an album there and three players I imagine most of you have never heard of any of those players. Sadly, they're all passed away, long, long since gone. Herb Ellis, for those in Australia who might be fans of James Morrison, was the guitar player that played on James Morrison's first version of Snappy 2. Oh, yeah. And uh, with Ray Brown yeah, on bass yeah, and Herb yeah. Ellis on guitar. So some of our Australian jazz fans might know that. Barney Kessel played guitar with Charlie Parker in that era. Now, Mike, you and I actually had the pleasure of hearing Herb Ellis and Barney yeah. Kessel play many, must be, I don't know how many years ago, 40 years yeah. ago, maybe more, yeah. probably more, yeah. uh, at a little jazz club in, in Brisbane. Yeah. And uh, I, I remember it well. Those two guys played very, very differently. Yeah. Uh, Barney Kessel played with what you might call when you first see and hear him play a sloppy looking technique but 
uh, he was the guy that was charged with keeping up with Charlie Parker. So imagine after the mm. great Charlie Parker doing a, mm. a solo at a thousand miles an hour. I think Barney had sort of said he'd come up with the technique to try and play at the speed that Parker was playing. Yeah, and that was life life changing to see these guys because yeah. a lot of things I'd hear on records. Um, I figured out the only way you could do this was by using your thumb over the top on the bass okay, strings. Yeah. And uh, the problem was that was not correct guitar technique. Not in the Nick Manilov. No, well, not, no, well, and a lot no, of other guys no, as well. Right, that's right. You, you know, yeah. you would just basically get hit with a bolt of light. Yeah, yeah. Now, the problem with that was, because I couldn't see these guys, it was years later. So I, when I'd be playing, I'd always be trying to put the music stand up and try and get that sound. I could sort of get the sound that they mm. were getting, that bluesy type of sound or whatever, that pedal tone. Yep. Uh, but I didn't want anybody to see, so I didn't have the music stand up, so just make that sound. But in case the music police caught me, yes. uh, I'd be in trouble with that. But um, later on, once I saw Barney, and I thought, to hell with that. Barney there goes the music it. stand. I'm doing it too. So look at this. Get the spotlight For on. anyone so, who's, yeah. who's ever seen Barney Kessel play, it's, it's not pretty. His technique is yeah. really yeah. unconventional. But the sound was amazing, yeah. the energy he Absolutely, put in. and that's what um, he's hearing in his head again. Like yeah. he, he wouldn't even know what he looks like. No, See, Barney no, no it's care. a different era. There's not, none of this videotape no. in it. What about three musicians, and again, incredibly hard, but three musicians who were not guitar players that greatly influenced the direction you took in music or, or how you feel about music and, and helped, I suppose, get a path to where you are today. So this is people, not guitar players. Okay, well, I'd have to say um, Bill Evans. The piano, piano, the jazz legend composing as well, yeah, Bill Evans, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And why, what just the, what, what about Bill uh, attracted you to? Again, you know? the textures, like it's the chords. Um, He's very much from that uh, Ravel, Debussy background with that impressionistic sort of sound. Mm -hmm. um, and I love doing that when I'm putting things together because I've worked out that what I was really trying to find initially is a satisfactory way of mixing colours. And you get that by having this tension and release or the sweet and sour. Yes. And one of the things that creates a lot of interest is an ambiguous sound. Yeah. So instead of playing, yeah. whatever, just a straight A minor, I look for mm. a way of playing an A minor chord uh, that has a particular emotion. And then then from there you'll just go from A minor to whatever chord you're going to. And you want to get that flavour. And uh, Well, I think I, you've just touched what you said a bit earlier. It's the feeling, the emotion that music can create rather than that if I play an A, C, a G and a whatever that it's a such and such chord. No, um, yeah. So, and it's also interesting, this is a good question because you've listened to way beyond guitar players and and as I said, it, you know, mate, when I hear you play uh, over the years and what we've heard today is you actually don't sound like a guitar player and that's no. probably the biggest compliment I can give you. You sound beyond the guitar. And, and I, you could hear a you know, hundred guitar players, they'll be shredding away or they'll be, you know, comping on some old chords in the background. But it's really hard, uh, you know, we come back to Herb Albert. Mm. You know, Miles Davis paid Herb Albert an incredible compliment. It's something we always said. Hear three notes, you know it's Herb. Yeah. Three notes yeah. from Herb Albert. They could be the easiest notes you could ever play on the trumpet you know it's her because it's his sound. Well, I think that's it. See, it's nothing about playing no. fast or... High or loud. Yeah. Or, no, yeah. no, it's not that at all. Um, so other than Bill, who's two other musicians that are not guitar players that had that significant impact on your on your. Well, strange or not, as to go to a diverse sort of um, mm. spectrum here, I'd say Steve Gadd. Steve Gadd, the drummer. Drummer, yeah. Steve Gadd, the drummer. Well, I'm not surprised, mate, because... You play, whether you're playing lead or rhythm, you play with an incredible time field. And folks, you know, you've seen the video tonight of Mike playing at 64. If you have a look at his right hand when he's playing, it doesn't. In fact, you were accused, uh, just on a lighter moment, you were accused by the uh, music mafia in the early days in Gympie, who sort of ran their operation a bit like the tow truck industry, that 
you know, it was very, com you know, even though that some of those jobs were absolute crap, there was a fair bit of competition yeah. for any job that went in yeah. Gympie. Yeah. And one of the biggest criticisms levelled against you is that you played with a funny strum. Yes. You were the guy that had a funny strum. And if you actually look at Mike's strum when he plays, it goes back to that banjo concept of his first uh, teacher, in my mind. You play, you've got a very powerful strum, and I wonder whether that comes from you being confronted by a, a guy who had to be loud on an acoustic instrument in the pre-PA era to earn his supper. Oh, definitely. I, I, I'm very thankful for the playing the banjo. There's some elements there that I know that I use. Yeah. Um, and just going back a, a cog, uh, the uh, guy that accused me of the funny strum years later took lessons off me and then later on his son took lessons off me. So the thing is, I've still got a funny strum, yeah. guys. That's what I'm Stick saying. Stick with the strum. I, I'm yeah. sticking with that. But I it, but, but I think what it says is even from the very beginning... People recognise you didn't play like them. No, that's um, right. No. You know, uh, the Gibson ES three four five in its original setup um, had a five way variatone oh, switch, yeah. which on on the rebuild uh, I've had disconnected because there was only ever two good sounds on it, and uh, the cost of putting in a new variatone was horrendous and right. a four month wait. But I do remember that the um, tow truck mafia one day <laughs> thought you had 32 different sounds yes. out of your new Gibson yeah, guitar. They counted it and and from memory, you, like me, would set your Gibson guitar on one sound yeah. and the rest was in your hands. Yeah. Yeah. But for people to hear Mike play and think that's one sound, that's one effect, that's something else he's yeah. doing, all of that is coming through his hands and it's coming through his head. It's not the technology. It, no. it, it really isn't. No. No. So, Steve Gadd, I had the opportunity to see Steve Gadd live playing Brisbane probably about two years ago, and uh, I think I mentioned to you, no fireworks on the drums. Like, there was oh, nothing yes. like a... Uh, there's nothing. There was nothing even remotely like a wild drum solo in the night, no. and it was his band, the Steve yeah, Gadd band. Yeah. But the moment, you know, the, the four was counted in, Steve is just, you know, locked into a groove and just one of the best sounds you'll ever hear from a drum mm -hmm. kit. It was the feel yeah. of Steve Gadd, yeah. not the fireworks. No, no. Not no. the fireworks. And that was uh, in a, 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 a thousand room, um, maybe not even that, maybe 600 people there in a in a place called the Tivoli in, in Brisbane. So uh, really great thrill to see mm. Steve Gadd live. Mm. Mm. And who else, mate? What's another player? Well, I'm squeezing a bit of a wild card here. This is definitely from the other side of the... Fence. I'd say Jacqueline Dupre. Now, this is a celloist. Okay. And Jacqueline is a wonderful celloist. And what I love about her is the depth of emotion. Uh, one of the best compliments I've ever had, a really good recording engineer I was working at a studio, and he said, you know, you're really a singing guitarist, not a guitar player who sings. I totally agree. And We've heard it tonight. I've, We've heard it. Yeah. I thought, wow, it's cool. Yeah. Because that's what I'm trying to do. See, if I went back to the Tony Matola, oh. the Bob Venia, yep. they're Italian, that singing sort of bel canto type of singing they get, and, and it's all this vibrato and things, but making, uh, getting the beauty of tone out of one single note. Yeah, and, uh, fantastic. And Jacqueline, the same thing. If you ever get a chance to hear any recording by her, um, it's unbelievable. And the cello is such a warm sounding yep. instrument where the guitar can be cold and harsh and twangy. Brittle, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just want to uh, put up a testimonial here by one of your former students because I think this is a, a, a real evidence that the way you have inspired people who have come to learn of you. Can you tell us about this one, mate, Aidan's testimonial? Well, the good thing about these sort of guys, like Aidan, he plays like himself and that's what I think is the real thing that I get the best thrill about is the people that are able to develop their own style they don't sound like me good like I don't sound like anybody no. else, so I don't want them to sound like me it's already me one of me that's enough and do you think that's something that you helped teach these people to play like themselves I just think I encourage them to uh, 
keep going their own way, to find their own way. You've got to find your own way in life. Uh, yep. To me, the whole thing, music and life, it's the same thing. To me, it's like a combination of hanging on and letting go. Yep. It's that I balance. Agree. It is isn't the great it? like Winton Marsalis. Music is life. Yeah. Well, that's what it is. hello. Thank you, Winton. That's yeah. yeah. We don't need any more. Let's have a listen to Aidan talk about his experience of working with Mike as a student in Mike's role as a teacher of the guitar. I began learning the guitar under the tuition of Mike Hayes several years ago, um, and I can honestly say it has served me very well since. Um, I can certainly say that if you're after a tutor with incredible knowledge and an immense amount of enthusiasm, Mike is certainly the man to go to. That's great, Mike. That's a really good compliment. I think the best thing you can do as a teacher is inspire a student to be themselves and be the best they can be. Just want to play a quick name association game with you here. Just a rapid fire answer of your memory of seeing these people live in concert here in Australia. Cat Stevens. Oh, wow. Well, he's a guitar player, mate. <laughs> he definitely is. Yeah, yeah. Wow, Mike just said, wow, I remember we saw Cat Stevens together, I think it was down the Gold Coast yeah. or at Festival Hall in Brisbane and uh, Cat was in his prime yeah. and it still just amazes me the series of great songs mm -hmm. um, that that he Fantastic wrote stories, aren't they? Oh, That's the thing. Really great, great stories. Story what about Sonny Stitt? Sonny Stitt, oh, good God. Now, guys, we'll put some photos up of these yeah. people, like, um, but you really need to check out these players. Sonny Stitt was an amazing saxophone player, and this is back in the year, I think, Mike, you were still playing the tenor sax yeah. at this stage. And Mike and I got the chance to see Sonny Stitt and uh, Richie Cole, yeah. the great alto player. Sadly, these guys are no longer with us. But... Um, the shadow of your smile. The Sonny shadow Stitt of your smile. It remains in the top five music moments yeah. in my life, unaccompanied. At the end yeah. of the night, so they've been playing jazz and bebop and whatever, and, and to end the night, Sonny comes out on his own, everyone's gone, piano player's gone and the bass player, and, the, and he just plays the most yeah. breathtaking solo tenor sax version of The Shadow of Your Smile. And I can still remember yeah. to this day, it was a downstairs basement jazz club, yeah. and walking up the stairs I can remember uh, a couple and the lady saying to her husband or a partner, well, that's reinstated my belief in the tenor saxophone. Yeah. Now, this was an era of yeah. the scream and squawk yeah. and squeal and raunchy tenor sax, yeah. you know what I mean? The honk and whoop yeah. and, and, the, and the sheet of sound playing. Yeah. Honk, style playing. Sonny just played, absolutely sang mm. through his saxophone. Yeah. No, Do you remember no, that? I remember that yeah. very clearly. Uh, I want to mention not a player, but a song title, Emily. Don Burroughs. At, where was Don the at? Amble. That's at the Pine. Yeah, at the Pine. It, mate, there's a few people around, and Bob Tryon, our friend Bob from Gimpy Musicland was there, and the late Doug Chapman, who originally founded Gimpy Musicland. I just want to talk about Doug for a minute, because Doug yeah. was a self-confessed um, beginner on, on, on music. But I could walk into his shop and say, G'day, Doug, Emily. And he absolutely, we would stand there in silence, in reverence to this moment we all shared. Yep. And it's hard to put it in words, but it's probably the time in my life where I felt, and let's keep religion out of it, but whether it's God or the universe, uh, it wasn't Don playing the flute no. that night. No, way past it. Yeah, amazing. What about George Benson? You play a George Benson. George Benson we got yes. to see George Benson play. I hope he doesn't want his guitar back. Oh, I don't to, know. Yeah. George will probably have a few minutes. <laughs> What's your memory of seeing George Benson play live? Well, it just, again, just it totally expands what's possible on the guitar. You think, goodness, man, yeah. what is this guy doing? I mean, like, his ideas, just fantastic. Incredible free player. Just yeah. incredibly free. And, and George was famous for his commercial success but I, I encourage, I'm uh, sure you would research George Benson yeah. before and after his commercial yeah, yeah. success there's some great stuff on yeah. YouTube of George playing the blues yeah. um, and between you and me I think George can play no, the blues. What about Oscar Peterson? Oscar Peterson, goodness me well that's a monster 
There's no room. The best thing you can do there is just leave the stage. <laughs> You've got everything covered. As a guitar player, I think nah. it's just walk away, nah, wouldn't you? Leave it alone. Go get a, a snack or Where something. Where can yeah. you fit a yeah. note in? The great Oscar nah. Peterson on piano, the late great Oscar Peterson. Yeah. Um, we had the privilege of seeing Oscar with another great performer, Joe Pass. Joe Pass, I knew you were going to say that. What is Brisbane your memory Town of Hall. seeing? Yeah, Brisbane, Brisbane Town, Town Hall. Hall. Yep. What's your memory of... Joe Pass, mate. Well, Joe had this incredible ability and the common sense to know there's nothing to do there. So yeah. he would sit there while yeah. Oscar would play. And then when Joe played, Oscar just played you know, left hand. Yeah. Um, but phenomenal. Again, just incredible. And the thing is that they were all good lessons because those guys were listening to each other like oh. crazy. And, and folks, for you out there watching this, you can see Mike's face light up because we actually experience these things. It's one thing nowadays to type in YouTube and yep. Oscar Peterson, and that's very scary. Yep. But when you're in a concert and you're seeing it live and you're hearing it live, Oscar in full flight is a... Uh, but it's it's a not only is it a happy memory, it's an inspiring memory, it, isn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. Absolutely inspiring. Hey, hey. What about Larry Adler? Larry Adler? The Goodness famous chromatic man. harmonic, if I remember, yes. we saw Larry play. And Larry was probably uh, right at the end of his life. He was he, he, like probably 80 years old when we saw Larry. Was that the convention center? No, it was, at the, uh, it was at the QPAC, the Queensland Performing Arts Centre. Okay. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful acoustic yeah. hall in Brisbane. Yeah. Um, and it was packed. The yes. place was packed. And what do you remember about Larry's sound on the harmonica? Unbelievable. Yeah. Just like a whole orchestra. Yeah, and Larry was a, a, a very good piano player too. Yeah. And Larry performed one of the <laughs> the rare party tricks of playing Summertime yeah. on his chromatic harmonica in the right hand and an amazing mm -hmm. accompaniment to yeah. Summertime. No one else, just Larry yeah. doing that. And, uh, you know, there's so many more we could talk about. Maynard Ferguson, like, hello. <laughs> Do you remember that how we yeah. found out about this? Well, how we found We were driving, we were driving along the past, highway. Yeah. There's a the, down south of where we are, about halfway between Gympie and Brisbane. There's a there was a place still there. It's no longer called the Etamunga Pub, but behind that hotel was a sports field. And and yeah. this is going way back. Mm. This is probably going back again, forty years or maybe thirty years. I don't know. It's mm. a long time mm. ago. Mm. And we would often drive down the highway and come back the coast way yeah. just for, and we'd have a chat, we'd be talking about things and have dinner down there. And we're driving past on the highway and there's a big sign up that says, Maynard Ferguson <laughs> here tonight. And I can still remember, I still look at, like, Maynard Ferguson here, like virtually out in the middle of the yeah. bush playing in a, on a sports field mm. with a bit of a, a thing. And anyway, we sort of thought, well, we can't risk it. No. It might be a joke. Yeah. But we went over and we bought some tickets. And um, what do you remember about hearing Maynard Ferguson's trumpet sound live? What about the warm up? Do you I remember, remember hearing the his warm up? Yeah. <laughs> I remember the warm up, the sound bouncing off the trees. Massive sound. Like the, the band, his band was setting yep. up out the front, but you could hear this undeniable sound of yep. Maynard Ferguson. Yeah, He's warming up, playing at the back of the stage aimed into a rainforest yeah. and the sound no microphone the yeah. sound was massive yeah. and i think the energy of maynard at his best particularly and and when we got to see him uh, he was still in pretty good yeah. form yeah. it was one of those powerful yeah. moments and there's a photo somewhere that we've seen of doc severinson and maynard ferguson both pointing oh. in their prime when they were young players at a single microphone mm -hmm. i remember we often sort of thought, you know, how would you be, oh, how would you feel to be that microphone? I'd move. Two of the <laughs> most powerful <laughs> trumpet players the world's ever produced. Um, what One more, Mike. Um, Warren Daly. How oh, do you remember about Warren? Down in Sydney. Yeah. yeah. Was push club, was it? With his mate Errol Buddle okay, on tenor sax. Warren hearing. Daly on drums. Errol Buddle on tenor sax and Cole Nolan on piano. Well, I think that we just come back from the States one time and we'd never heard anything better over there. It's it's, it, this is true. We got yeah. to see Plaz Johnson, yep. Mr. Pink Panther, at Dante's Jazz Club. Yep. And Plaz played really good. We yes. were sitting like a metre away. But we come back to Sydney or, or, or I think we either... No, I think we had we come back yeah. to Sydney and we were staying in Sydney for a while and we went to the... A little jazz club at the, or a little restaurant at the Rocks area of Sydney, right yeah. near. If you've ever been to Sydney, not far from the Opera House, 
and the quartet for that night, I think it was uh, Dieter Void on bass, yes, yep, Cole yep, Nolan on yep. piano, Warren Daly on drums, and Errol Buttle in his prime on the sax. Mm-hmm. And can I say, folks, that yeah. if you've never heard those players play together, there is an album out called the the Buttle Nolan Quartet. Oh, I think yes, if you can yeah, find yeah, it, yeah, yeah, um, on get there. it. Because I remember yeah. that album because <laughs> this bloke here, I wished I could find the 8mm camera. But standing up in our backyard, he'd only just got his Selma tenor and it's yep. beautiful. He did an amazing mm. lip sync equivalent on the tenor saxophone yeah. to Errol Buttle in full flight. Errol at, at his absolute best. And somehow or other, you would swear Mike was actually playing. If you found that, that would be amazing yeah. to see Lucky nowadays. we don't have the audio from what was coming out. Oh, the, the sound was absolutely... me. Yeah, it was yeah. just no, rubbish that he's good. playing. But but he was miming yeah. along playing Errol Buttle at, at, Errol at his absolute best. Um, I, I recommend to people <laughs> to track down a record called Buttle's Doubles. Yeah. You can yeah. still get it. And Errol playing... Bye Bye Blackbird on mm. that, I think, is the best example of mm. the tenor sax in a jazz setting you'll ever hear. So, Mike, let's wrap it up. If you could go back in time and have a session with your 13-year-old self, on your 13th birthday, if you could time travel and and give your 13-year-old self some advice about music, what would you say to that person? Uh, practice more. Practice more. Wow. There's a quote. Practice more. So what you're saying is what people hear, the end result of your playing, it's through hard work. Yeah. It's practicing. Yeah. It's thinking and practicing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, if you could do that same time travel and and tell that 13-year-old self one tip about life, not music, a bit of advice about life, what would you say to yourself at 13, having been through what you've done? Well, I'd say to keep moving. Don't stay in one spot. Once you get comfortable, you're in trouble. Great. That's great advice, folks. That's really great advice. It's from the Music Mind podcast. You heard it here. The great Mike Hayes, two really very solid pieces of advice. Mate, you're 64. Do you, do you, does your alarm clock have the Beatles when I'm 64 playing when you wake up in the morning? No, but I did play it this year when it came to my birthday. I thought, now you, I, I you can play actually it? play that. Yeah, and the, just, it's amazing that the guys that wrote that, um, Ringo and Paul, who are still around, um, are pushing way beyond 64. Well, It's exciting, isn't it? Really? You know, we, we spoke earlier about like defining music. I think if you read the lyrics for Imagine... Oh, it sums it up. Mate, greatest, I think it's the greatest song ever. It does. It and and, really and just a real life um, story there. I was, you know, at a friend's place in Brisbane recently who's just starting out on the guitar. And I said, oh, well, you know, I'll bring my guitar in. I'll, let's have a bit of a jam. And, and so she said, oh, well, can you play me something? So I played just an improvised blues. And I actually thought I played it really, really well. In my own mind, I thought, mate, that's a magic moment. And she said to me, look, that's nice. Could you play me something I might know? And I'm sort of thinking, geez, the ego just took a real hit there. <laughs> so I played Imagine, yeah. and she just loved it. She, she said, yeah. that is absolutely amazing. So I think there's a, uh, oh, you yeah. know, it comes back to Jerry Bird, melody, melody, yeah. melody, well, yeah. wow, there's a good story in Imagine. Play songs, yeah. play songs. Yeah. So folks, just to end, we talked earlier about when we were growing up as kids here in Gympie that... Music was just not on as far as in the school education thing. So, Mike, I think you'd agree that in your time it was pretty much discouraged rather than encouraged to have any sort of artistic flair, yep. and particularly in music. Is that your memory of oh, your school time? Definitely, yeah. 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 Um, I just want to give a, 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 a credit to a, a school teacher who taught me maths in grade 11 and, and grade 12. He'd come up from Sydney, Marty Reedon, and there's a photo of Marty there playing the flute with me strumming the guitar and a friend of mine from school, Tim McMahon, on bass. Now, Marty, by his own admission, uh, could barely play a note on the flute, but he came from Sydney and he was well aware of a person who could play the flute. Do you remember... Marty taking us somewhere. Mike, do you want to tell that story? Yes. Um, well, I think the thing at that stage, I thought I was going pretty good on guitar. Oh, hero. Yep. Yep. And 
it had just after we put out that first single. And uh, yep. I remember he, he'd come around, we played in the single, and I think he, he knew that he needed to uh, educate us. A Broaden bit. the horizons. Yes, absolutely. Yep. So yep. I remember being dragged, kicking and stream, uh, screaming in the back of his car. Yeah, yeah Marty drove us drove to us Brisbane. He said, yep. yeah, I'll drive you down there, I yep. want you to hear this. And yep. I'm like, oh my goodness me, it's such a waste of time, yep. you know. What, what are we going to hear? I feel the same thing because I, I also thought I was a hero on guitar at this time. And, you know, we were, we were playing. We were very ill-equipped yes. for the event that Marty took us to. Mm-hmm. What was the event that we went to? Don Burroughs and George Goller doing a workshop yep. at, at the Queen, Queensland Conservatorium of Music. Yeah. And on their own, just yeah. Don and George. And Don had his clarinet, his concert flute and his alto sax and, and a bag full of percussion instruments. Mm. George, I think, was, had his six string made on or was he playing seven string? I that think day? six string, six made string. it even worse. Yeah, and you know, we couldn't understand a thing those guys played, but we knew it was good. Well, most of really made, good. Most of made it worse. The fact they had a six string there, and I didn't recognise one thing that no. this guy played on guitar for the except, whole. Except, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. No, he did talk about he was the banjo player who played the theme from Skippy. Yes, that, that's right. So he played it on the guitar, yeah. and I think you and me, yeah, I was happy the about that. only <laughs> chord we recognised in a, a two-hour yeah. session was a first position C chord yeah. when George. Um, <laughs> So, blah, 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 blah. so thankful for that. Yeah, you played that. And and you what you've got to understand is you, you know I've got sitting next to me one of the great guitar minds and he's just telling you he sat through a two hour yep. concert and could not recognise no. a single thing no. that George played on the guitar. Um, for a deja vu sort of moment, we're going to end this podcast today with a tribute to Don and George. And the amount of preparation that went into this was similar to our other videos. I remember I said to Mike, you know, we should do something to celebrate the influence that Don Burroughs and George Gola had on us. We should do a flute and guitar thing. And Mike said, oh, OK, well, uh, how about we just, you know, do something on the changes to a standard, uh, to a jazz stand. Yeah. Um, we'll do it in C. And when we, it. when we filmed it, like five seconds before we start playing this, Mike says, I'll do an intro. And, and when you look at it, like everything we've done here, this is on the spot. I completely miss Mike's one finger cue. I'm looking straight ahead that he was going to take a solo now. So there's so many things here that are hilarious when I look at it now. But I do think it's a great example. Another example, um, I just have a vision of some kid out there somewhere watching this and watching your hands and not recognising a single chord that you play on this, mate, because you do a brilliant job in accompanying in a George Golder style. So is there anything else before we watch this, mate? Is there anything else you'd like to to cover in closing? Any projects you're working on that you'd like people to know about or, or you know? Well, um, I'm, as we said, working on this sort of uh, virtual situation, right. I'm, I'm looking at putting the uh, guitar ensemble together again, like an international one, students I teach, and. and uh, time the line that time through the line Zoom or something. Yeah, yeah. Great. So that's, wow. what, that's one of the projects. Sign up, guys. Sign um, up there if you can play. Yeah, yeah. and uh, my wife and I, we used to run for about 18 months a internet radio station, so, uh, okay. a jazz station. That was very good because yep. uh, we uh, played albums that we've got that we actually played on and we'd get sales and that from that, but also people Great. would we'd play other records than that as well so yeah. that was a uh, time constraint there but uh, yeah. looking at going back to that but as I say really trying to reach out uh, with people in right around the whole globe now so the whole thing is much bigger we started in a small little pond locally in town here but now absolutely uh, reaching out there but I would also like to thank my wife Pippa who's very supportive and uh, in all my endeavors and um, help absolutely thing. going back to just on that, just going back to Herb Albert, um, uh, Herb is often, Herb's been married to Lani Hall for I think 48 years right. and when people ask Herb about his success he says well he married his angel. Uh, I think oh, you did that absolutely, too. Absolutely, without a doubt. Mike, I want to end this with another quote. I love reading autobiographies and I've just finished reading the latest version of that written by Elton John, the famous pop superstar. But there's a really powerful way he ends the book. It's the last line in his book. And I'm going to read this quote. 
Elton says there's really no point in asking what if. The only question worth asking is what's next? We're going to end with uh, this clip, which we've called for Don and George. I hope you've enjoyed this. Come back often. We're going to have Mike back. We've got to have him back for some more discussions on specific topics. So you're happy to come back? I'd love to. Thanks for having us too, Brian. I've really enjoyed it. And that concludes our discussions with one of the greatest music minds you'll find anywhere, the great Mike Hayes. It's pretty fair to say that Mike and I enjoyed producing this podcast. If you have any doubts, check out the faces on these two guys just a couple of seconds after the last note had sounded when we recorded for Don and George. You can reach out and connect with Mike via his website, mikehayes.com.au that's m-i-k-e h-a-y-e-s dot com dot a-u please reach out and connect with Mike you'll find he's a humble genius of the guitar and only too happy to help with any aspect of music that he feels confident to work with you on you can connect with me via my website brianhayes.biz b-r-i-a-n H-A-Y-E-S dot B-I-Z or B-I-Z for our friends in the United States. I really hope you've enjoyed spending some time delving into the music mind of my very first guest, Mike Hayes. I look forward to seeing you again on the Music Mind podcast where I will endeavour to bring you some fascinating discussions from some of the best musicians in the world. Bye for now.